Hey, it's Jared with Gear and Light. I'm here with the Panasonic Lumix GH6, and I have some settings that I changed on this camera to improve my workflow and optimize this camera for my shooting style. And I'm gonna share those with you here today. So the GH6 is a camera that I picked up uh, to test out because after seeing it and hearing about it for so long and people talking about it and just really loving the camera, I decided I needed to see if there was something I was missing out on. So I produced a full review video and I also have a comparison video between this camera and the Sony a7 IV, should you be interested. I'll make sure to link to those videos down below. But I have some settings that I typically change on any camera and being that the GH6 is different, there were some different settings that I went in and adjusted. And so if you are uh, setting up a camera for the first time or maybe figuring out how you can better optimize your experience with your GH6, I hope that this video helps you out. So I'm gonna start with some real intro tips here before I jump into the nine that I have promised. The first being that you need to set the time, the date and time, on your camera. The date and time is extremely important because it writes that to the file. And so if you have not gone and set your date and time, you need to go down to the little wrench menu, go over and go to clock set, and then set your clock and make sure that you have all of that set correctly. It's uh, extremely important um, because it does write all of that to your file and you wanna make sure that all of that is correct because when you are looking at files on your computer, when you're sorting things, if the files are not correct, then you'll have problems. Also make sure to go and set the time zone as well. The next thing you always want to do is format your cards in the camera. That is also under the wrench icon, under the card file icon. And you format your cards within the camera because the camera writes a specific way and it's not necessarily the same way that your computer may write. So traditionally we would think, well, I'll format things on my computer. It's much better to format your card in the camera. Uh, not on this camera, but in cameras that I've used in the past, I'll have uh, issues with files writing to the card or perhaps even having corrupt files. And the best solution is to make sure that you formatted your cards in the camera. So after you've backed up anything that you have on your card, making sure that you copy it off of your card to somewhere safe, put the card back in your camera, format it, and make sure it's ready for its next use. Another thing I change is the beep notification on the camera. Under the wrench icon, under in, out, under beep, we can select to turn the beep off. You have two different volume levels here or just flat off altogether. That's not going to get rid of some of these other options such as having an electronic shutter sound when you are shooting silent shutter with this camera. Um, this is simply going to turn off the beep that happens when you achieve focus and some other features of the camera that typically have an audible tone. Uh, that to me is distracting when I'm shooting photos or video of people. Having that beep constantly going whenever the camera is achieving focus is a little bit distracting and I just like to silence that all together and be as stealthy as possible. So one of the first settings I always change on a camera is I put a photo setting into camera raw and so under the image quality the first camera tab here and you need to make sure that you are in a photo mode here you can go over to picture quality and I choose raw plus standard which means that the camera is going to capture a raw image plus a standard quality JPEG. Now the reason that I do this is because in this camera it does have dual card slots but it only has one SD card slot and I can't seem to find my other card which is the CF Express Type B card and so unless you're running dual cards and you can have a backup I think it's really important to make sure that you're shooting something that is a backup to the raw file. The raw file that comes out of this camera is uh, relatively new. Um, it took forever for Adobe to add it or to get it added to uh, Photoshop and Camera Raw and Adobe Lightroom. And so for me, I like to have a backup and JPEGs are just very consistent backups. Raw images are better because they include more data and they're more flexible for editing, but JPEGs are a great backup. And most of the time I'm not having issues, so I don't need the highest quality JPEG. I just need a fallback just in case I have issues. So I set raw plus standard. And if you wanted to, you can also go raw plus fine. And if you have both cards in your camera, 
you can record RAW to one card, you can record JPEG backups to another card, or you can record both to both cards so that you have backups. So I'm a manual shooter. I like using manual mode. I've actually taught a course on shooting in manual mode, and so I make sure that my camera is set in manual mode. Now, for photo settings, that's pretty easy. You just simply go to M right here, you rotate to M, and you are shooting in manual mode for photography. But in video, you have to go and tell the camera in the settings where uh, what you want to shoot. And so I'm going to go into menu, I'm under the camera menu under image quality and exposure mode I've set to manual. What manual does is it gives you manual control over your shutter speed, your aperture, and your ISO. Of course, your white balance is still something that you would set either to auto or you would set custom, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and there are some other shooting modes here as well. So if you're not totally comfortable with shooting full manual, I would recommend perhaps shooting in shutter priority mode, locking down your shutter to a specific uh, shutter speed based on what you're trying to achieve, and then let the camera do automatic ISO and automatic aperture until you get comfortable. But you're gonna get the best control out of your camera and the best overall image by shooting in manual mode. The next setting is for video specifically, and this is your video photo style, they call it here in the camera. And this is where you set your picture profile, essentially. You can leave it set to standard, which is what it comes as, and the standard color out of the camera is pretty nice. But I've been playing around with it, and I really like the Cinelike D2 as an option. It is a little less contrasty than standard, and if I want to add contrast in, it's very easy to do that in a video editor, but it's not easy to remove contrast. Now, another option would be just to go straight to V-Log and shoot V-Log, but if you're more of a beginner, V-Log's a little bit tricky because it's harder to tell whether or not your shot is properly exposed. So I would utilize the option in here, if you do shoot V-Log, to uh, use the LUT. There's a, a Rec. 709 LUT that will uh, you can apply and it gives you a better idea of what your overall exposure is. Or if you have a custom LUT, you uh, can import that into the camera and apply that or even just use an external monitor. So V-Log is a great option, but I also like Cinelike D2. There's Cinelike V2, but V2 is very contrasty. So I like D2 because it's less contrasty and I can of course add that in in post-production. I'm gonna go ahead and call this one 3A because I don't necessarily think it needs to stand alone, but underneath your image format, which is the camera menu and the little movie uh, piece of film there, you would go under record file format and you have MP4, MOV, and Apple ProRes. Now MP4 is probably what you'll wanna shoot in most of the time unless you need Apple ProRes. Apple ProRes is gonna be very large files and so I only recommend using that if you really need the most dynamic range possible or if you're gonna be editing on a machine that on a Mac that doesn't have uh, as much power and you just need to get through that workflow fast. Otherwise, MP4 is a great option. Apple ProRes, I would probably only use if you are an, an editor in Final Cut Pro or maybe even in DaVinci Resolve, but um, yeah, it's gonna be a little bit more tricky. So MP4 is more, um, is more widely accepted across the board and uh, is a go-to. Not that you can't edit Apple ProRes on PCs or other software, it's just that sometimes it's not as fast. It really does depend on your configuration. The record quality is going to vary based on what you're trying to achieve. I typically am always sh shooting in 4K 10-bit 24p. Unless I need to slow things down using 60p or 120p, then I'll move to those options. But most of the time I'm going to be shooting in 24p. I try not to shoot anything in 60p when I don't need it to be in 60p. I want it to be down in 24p so that I just have a file right out of the camera that is perfect for that. And so these, uh, these settings here are how you set that for your camera. Now the GH6 does a decent job at autofocus detection and in photos it does that well and in video it has the option to do it also but by default it's turned off. So if you are shooting people and you want the camera to maintain focus on a subject you'll want to turn autofocus detection setting on and then you can set the detecting subject to either human, face, eye, or animal plus human. 
Now, I haven't tested that extensively, but typically I would say face, eye, or human would be the option that you would want to go for. Human tends to just uh, identify that it is a person. Um, face eye will determine that it is an eye and it will choose the eye or attempt to choose the eye that's closest to the camera. Now, if you have problems with eye detection, locking on and, and staying locked on, or even, or even it being responsive enough, you may want to switch it to human. I found that I had to switch it back to human many times just because the camera wouldn't do as good of a job as I would have hoped staying locked on to a person's eye. So number five has to do with audio recording levels, and we're going to take a look at that here in the camera. There's a few settings here that we're going to change. The first one is under audio, so the first microphone, audio one, sound record level display. I set that to on. I want that to be on all the time. Even if I'm in a photo mode, I kind of want that on because with a camera like this, I'm going to be shooting video more. Even when I'm in a photo mode, I can hit the record button and start shooting video. So I want the audio levels to be displayed all the time, and sometimes they're not. So I set that to on. I also come down and set the record level appropriate to the microphone or if I'm using the internal microphone. Most of the time I'm shooting with this, uh, this Rode Video Mic Go 2, and I'll need to adjust the audio levels based on my environment. So with those uh, set, you have audio levels that are ready to go for whenever you're filming. And so uh, having the audio levels displayed all the time means that when I do want to go and film that my audio levels are good because I'm always seeing my audio levels there. They're never hidden even if I'm not in a video shooting mode. And so I like that. On a lot of other cameras you only get to see them if you're in a video shooting mode or after you start hitting, you hit the record button and start recording. In my opinion, that's already too late. I want to know what my audio levels are at all times, and it's not that big of a distraction to me to have them back on the screen, knowing that I can always go and shut them off if I need to. Now, number six is a histogram. I use a histogram all the time on the back of the screen to display uh, how my image is looking. I want to know if there's anything potentially blown out or anything that's just total black in my shot. And whether it's photo or video, that's very important. And so under the gear icon, under monitor display photo, you can turn on histogram. And so down here under histogram, I can go ahead and turn it on. And what it's going to do is it's going to bring me to the histogram. Now it's centered by default, but I can drag it anywhere that I want and move it down into the corner or move it out of the way. And that goes for even if I'm, I'm shooting and I need to move it, I just tap and drag it out of the way because maybe it does get in the way of your shot. But I think it's extremely important. For example, I can see that everything is a problem right now because the lens is pointing down at the table and everything is black. But uh, being able to see the histogram definitely helps out. It's not a full story of everything that's going on, but it definitely helps you identify big issues quickly. Number seven is the monitor grid lines. Now, I like having grid lines on my camera to really just help me frame up shots really quickly. A lot of times I'm very run and gun and I need to just get it done quick and having some lines lines on the screen, specifically the rule of thirds, is great for me because if I'm positioning somebody and I want that to be consistent, um, if I'm shooting interviews or walk and talks or anything like that, I want to make sure that I have some line of reference on the camera. And so I like having the rule of thirds on, so I'll just select that and then my rule of thirds lines are going to be overlaid on the screen and I can see them and make sure that everything is uh, proportionate in my shots. Being that I'm often shooting handheld, having a level shot is really important, and sometimes the horizon is not the best option. Uh, living up here in Montana, the horizon is uh, beautiful, but it varies in height, and uh, it's not easy to use the horizon level all the time. Uh, so the level gauge on the camera, which is under the gear, monitor display photo, and then about a little more than halfway down, level gauge, turn it on, and then I am able to see when my camera is level. And this is extremely important when I'm using the camera with a flip out screen that comes out to the side. Now, thankfully, this camera has a screen that tilts up, so I don't have to flip it out to the side unless I want to be viewing the, the camera from the front, viewing the screen from the front of the camera. But having that definitely helps me make sure that my image is level and that I'm not going to have to go and do a bunch of cropping later. That's uh, not so important for photo, but it is very important for video where we don't have a bunch of extra resolution we could throw away by cropping. 
Now the last setting that I want to set on the camera that I set on every camera is the copyright information. So under the wrench icon and card file, if we go down to copyright information, I can set the artist and the copyright holder. Uh, so the artist being me, so I would just put my name. So I could simply tap here, turn it on. Uh, I can go and set it also if I need to. And then you just can tap on the keyboard to set your name and make sure that uh, you have your name set as the copyright. And then the copyright holder, uh, whatever you want to display there. For me, I put all rights reserved in that spot because I want people to see that they cannot use this photo for anything. Like this photo is uh, copyright me. It is my photo and it is not, there. there's no usage rights that I have given for this image. Now, this is important because should your camera get stolen, should your SD card get lost and images be uploaded, should you um, put images online, having copyright information in there is really important because it tells people that this image is a professional image and that it cannot be used. And if somebody does use your image, you can request to have it taken down. Now, of course, people can strip that out of an image and it's not foolproof, but I found many images of mine that I did not give permission uh, that were pulled off of a blog article or social media that were used in something and it was very infuriating and so I made requests to have that pulled down and it was much easier because I already had the copyright information. Uh, copyright information on the files could also help uh, should your camera get stolen and some of your images end up somewhere online it could help track that down. So lots of good reasons to have the copyright written to the image. So that's going to do it for this video. Thanks so much for watching this longer video on settings. I know I kind of went exhaustive into my explanations a little bit there, but I think it's important that we set up our cameras properly so that we can use them to the best of their ability based on how uh, we intend to use them, our workflow, and all of that good stuff. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel here on Gear and & Light, and I hope to see you back in another one soon. Take care.